Welcome to Brain in a Vat. Today we have Rivka Weinberg with us and she's from Scripps College. She'll be talking about the meaninglessness of life and why we should be sad about it. Rivka, would you like to start with a case? So the case I'll start with is the case of Tolstoy, who in famously in midlife, when he had achieved a lot that he had wanted, he was a very well-known popular writer, he was wealthy, he had family, children, and he took a step back and was like, what's the point of all of it? And that, and I think a lot of people have that feeling when their lives are full of what they take to be meaningful. They have love, they have jobs that they find fulfilling, and they still have this feeling of, well, what's the point of all of it? And that is, I think, the question that leads you to realize that there is no point to all of it, which is sad. So Rivka, I am familiar with the kind of mindset you're describing, the what's the point of all of it sort of feeling. So I can relate to Tolstoy, except not with being as great a writer as he is, of course, but with the other stuff I can relate. But your view seems to be that he ought to feel that way, or it's appropriate that he feel that way. And not just that it is a quirk of human psychology that we're prone to feel that way sometimes. So suppose it's the case that I managed to get past this through, I don't know, taking up more hobbies. I'm working on harmonica right now, for example, or just more exercise and stuff. And then I just, I'm not thinking about this anymore. That's, that seems good, right? It, why should I feel sad if I can get it out of my mind somehow? So I don't think that you're morally or conceptually obligated to constantly walk away around like bemoaning how pointless your life is. But, and it's fine to distract yourself sometimes. I don't think that should be the whole focus of your life because I think you can have other kinds of meaning in your life, not what I call ultimate meaning, which is the point of your entire life. But I think that if you, the same way that let's say anything you do, you're working toward a point, you're building a house. And if you knew that it would fall down the second you built it, you would be disappointed, right? And so in the same way, if you realize that there is no point, no valued end for your entire life, for the thing that you do, this separate enterprise you do, which is you run your life and you're doing that for nothing, it's really sad and disappointing that you're putting all this effort and heartache in for nothing. And so it just is an apt feeling. It's properly responsive to the facts. And so you should be sad about it. It doesn't mean that you have to be sad every minute and you shouldn't distract yourself with your harmonica playing or get into something else, but at least you should take some time to think about the fact that this is sad because it's just the appropriate response to this kind of disappointment and to the facts. So it's a, it's an emotionally apt response, the same way that I mean, sad facts warrant sadness. So that in that sense, we should be sad about this very sad fact. We put so much work into our lives, into the running of our life. You don't just live, you lead your life and you're leading your life and you put work into it and you think about how your life fits into a whole and the things you want to accomplish and the legacy you want to leave and all of those kinds of ways in which you're doing the agential work of running a life and you're really doing it for nothing. So that is disappointing and it makes sense to be sad. It's just the apt response to the apt emotional response to the facts of the situation. So I don't doubt that Tolstoy felt this and that he felt that his life had ultimate meaninglessness. And I don't doubt that we all feel this at some point, but is that feeling necessarily correct? So wouldn't it be the case that we're mistaking two different things? So we might be mistaking the idea that our life as a whole is meaningless or is that we lack ultimate meaning to our lives with I'm not sure what to do next. So I've just completed this project. I've just married the woman I love. I've had a wonderful life in Tolstoy's case. I've raised wonderful children. I've engaged in all these projects. I've written these wonderful books. Now I don't know what to do next. Maybe it's that I don't know what to do next. That is actually what's going on, but that doesn't reduce the value of what came before. So this, I have two responses. One is I will explain why the reason I think that this is met, it's metaphysically impossible to have ultimate meaning. But I also don't think it's just about what to do next because Tolstoy knew what to do next. He had another novel in him. He had stuff to write. When this feeling occurs to you or to me, I know what to do next. I'm busy with my projects. It's not like I'm done with everything and just sitting around thinking, well, I got nothing else to do. My, the rest of my life is pointless. And so I, I don't think, uh, I, so that's why I just don't think it's the what to do next, because it's not just the letdown of a project. You can have other things lined up and still have this feeling.
But more to the point of why I'm so confident about this conclusion, it's because I think about what it means for something to have a point. And a point is a valued end. And a valued end always lies outside of the projects or the effort that we take that's aimed toward it or grounded by it. So if you're playing with your children, that's the action you're doing. And the value is, let's say, your intimacy and your love. That's not in the act you're doing. It's outside of it. Points, values are these abstract things and they're valued ends. So points, valued ends, always lie outside of the effort that is aimed at them. But your life includes your whole life and all the values that you value in it. You value justice. You value love. That's all in your life. That's why you give it this special place in your life. So then the effort of running your whole life has nothing outside of it. And so it cannot have a point. So the confidence I have in this conclusion is based on what I take points to be, the nature of points and the nature of a life. The nature of a point is that it's a valued end that lies outside of an act or an effort or an enterprise. And the nature of running your life, which is that everything that you value is inside it, leaving no way to reach outside of it. So that's the conceptual argument in answer to your question, as opposed to the practical answer, which is you can have this feeling when you know very well that you have many things to do next. So in one of your papers, you say that this is a metaphysical objection to ultimate meaning, but not like a purely logical objection. And that seems important because if it's a metaphysical impossibility for there to be ultimate meaning, that seems like it's one thing. But if it turns out that it's just a matter of definitions, like ultimate meaning is defined as a point that's outside of your life, but everything that can give your life meaning that can be the meaning of your life must be in your life that just seems like a purely logical inconsistency that renders ultimate meaning impossible i'm having a hard time feeling existential angst when i'm thinking about a purely conceptual impossibility i'm supposed to be sad over this purely conceptual possibility so could you clarify is this like a a metaphysical point or a logical point I think it's a metaphysical point, and I think the reason you should be sad about it is because it renders your efforts pointless. So you're like Sisyphus. This is very frustrating and sad. You're working for something you can't get, and you can't help but work at it. Because if you don't work at it, you're like not a person. You're not a human being. You're living like a rock or like an animal. So you have to put in all this effort, and you know it's going nowhere. You, it has the same structure as your other efforts that go somewhere. <laughs> but you know that this separate thing, this thing that you're doing, goes nowhere. So... It's a metaphysical impossibility, but it relates to your life because it means that something that you put a lot of effort into and a lot of feelings and thoughts and work has nowhere, cannot possibly reach a fruition. There's no fruition for it to reach. And so that's why I, it's not, that's why I think you are sad about it. Many people are, if you think it through. And if you didn't think it through, once you think it through, I think it should make you sad because of the relationship of these metaphysical facts to the life and the effort you lead and the effort you put into leading it. So I want to press this idea that a point lies outside of your life and the values that you have on a day-to-day -day basis that you generate in your life are inside your life. So ultimate meaning is going to point to something outside of your life, which can't be inside of your life. So your life can't have ultimate meaning. Am I understanding the argument roughly? Correct. Yes. A point, yes. Point is outside and your whole life has everything in your life is inside. Okay. So what I'm curious about is maybe there's another way to conceive of a life as having ultimate meaning, not by saying that life has ultimate meaning in it, but that it participates in a relationship with something that's ultimately meaningful. So yes, ultimate meaning will reside outside of my life but my life can have a relationship with it. So the kind of thinking that I have is, let's say I, I find the cure for cancer. It seems like I am relating to the outside world in a way that is extremely meaningful, but that meaning doesn't reside inside my life ultimately because of your definition of, of, of points, of ends, of value ends. So I grant that ultimate meaning must be somewhere outside of my life, so I don't have it but I'm participating in a relationship with it. I'm relating to the world in such a way that relationship we could say has enormous meaning. And that's what we should think about when we talk about ultimate meaning, the relationships that we participate in. What you're talking about is what I describe as everyday meaning. The things you do in your life 
that have points and have valued ends and are not the thing, this other thing you do, the meta project of running your life. So you cure cancer or you correct an injustice. And that is you have aimed towards something in your life. That's a value. Your values can be interpersonal. They can be outside of, they don't have to be selfish, right? They can be outside, but it's not outside of your life. So what you're describing is what I would call meaning. You're doing something that is meaningful, but it doesn't give this thing you're doing, this special project of running your life a point. So that remains meaningless. So it doesn't mean, again, so it's great. You have this everyday meaning. That's terrific. That's excellent. If not, we should probably all kill ourselves. Like that would be really terrible. But I don't, it doesn't give the, your life ultimate meaning. It doesn't give you this. So there's two things you do. There's the everyday things you do. And then there's the running of your life as its meta project of its own, which I think you put work into. And that is the thing that doesn't have ultimate meaning. Even if you have other values in your life that you engage with. How about this as an example? So suppose I, I have a child. So that child, it seems is a, is something valuable that I've generated in the world. And, but that child is not in my life only. That child has a life of its own, right? So then that's an example of everyday value. That's both inside my life and outside of my life. And couldn't we say that child is giving my life ultimate meaning because it constitutes something that I could aim towards outside of me. And the child is external to you, but the meaning is in your life. That's why you put it there. So an example I've given about this is let's say you, you masturbate, you're doing something by yourself in your own life. You do it for pleasure. That's your value. You have sex with somebody else. That's two people. It's external, but you're still doing something in your life. That's why you do it. You could will your busy penis to science for the benefit of posterity and future generations, and they can all enjoy it and learn all kinds of things from it. But the reason you're doing it is be, it's still a value within your life that you've chosen to do with your life because you value it in your life. It's not outside of the project of running your life. If it was outside of the project of running your life, you would have no reason to do it, right? The same thing with your child. Your child is external to you. It's not inside you. But the meaning, the project or the effort that you put into your relationship with your child is in your life. Where else would it be? And so I think mostly the last few questions, I think if I understand your questions correctly, are really, I would say, uh, makes me think about the distinction between everyday meaning, which is the things that you do within your life that have meaning, have valued ends, like your relationship with your child or your sexual relationships with other people and or your the justice that you work for. And then this other thing you do, which is you run your life, you lead your life. Everything else is in it. Your child is in your leading of your life. Everything you do is in that project. Uh, so let me appeal to another example. Beethoven is in the news again recently because I guess uh, just have gotten a hold of some of his hairs and have tested it, tested them to see what's in his DNA. So... Apparently, Beethoven had this idea if he wanted to compose a certain number of pieces of music, he had them in mind and wanted to complete them before he died. And he struggled not only with hearing loss, but all sorts of other health problems like gastrointestinal problems and stuff. Beethoven did die shortly after completing what he wanted to complete. And so the first point is, it seems like those works that he was going to dedicate his entire life to creating this corpus that would then exist for hopefully centuries or millennia after he died to give people pleasure. It seems misdescribed to call that everyday meaning. I guess in a sense it was. It's everyday meaning for any particular day that he's there composing it. So I guess you could call it everyday meaning in that sense. But to say that it's merely everyday meaning seems to, I don't know, deny the sense that this could be like the motivating, unifying project of an entire life. And the other, the second point about this is we can imagine Beethoven recovering after he completed all of this and his hearing comes back. He doesn't have the gastrointestinal problems. And it seems to me that there are a couple of different attitudes he could have, both of which seem equally fitting. One of them is the one that you described Tolstoy having the sense of like, well, what do I do now? What's my purpose now? And you say, well, it's fitting for him to feel that way. But suppose that, in fact, he feels just a sense of pride, like, yeah, I've accomplished my mission in life, 
I feel really good about it. I'm going to enjoy a long retirement listening to the works I've created and the works of other composers and maybe tutoring some people and just basking in the, I don't know, the dusk of my li life and stuff. It seems that too is, an, is a fitting attitude. I don't see why it wouldn't be. I, I don't see what compelling reason he has to take the more negative kind of view of his life. So I think you're saying a lot of different things. So let me go through some of them. So Beethoven, there's nothing mere about a great accomplishment just because it's everyday meaning. Everyday meaning is not mere, nothing. It's a big deal. And if you excel at that and you're extraordinary, then it's extraordinary. It's awesome. But it is still not a reason for living your life as a whole. So let me take your case. Beethoven doesn't die. He lives for hundreds of years past his great accomplishment. Like we think of Jonas Salk. He cures polio and then he lives not only a hundred years, a thousand years. 2,000 years, at some point, even he's going to say, what's the point of my life, right? And it's not because what to do next. He could think of things to do next. It's just, uh, so are we getting distracted or dazzled by Beethoven's great accomplishment? It's a great accomplishment. His life was extraordinary, meaningful in a certain way, in an everyday sense that has a longer shelf life than most other people. But still, if he lived forever, he would begin to wonder if, and he finishes his corpus, he'd be like, well, what's the point of the rest of my life? We can think of something else. Let's say somebody is aiming at justice and then they achieve it, right? At some point, things are fair enough. Otherwise you're just being nitpicky and annoying people. So there's enough. It's just enough. What's the point of the rest of your life? And so I don't see your cases as showing that Beethoven has ultimate meaning. I see your cases as showing that he had extraordinary everyday meaning, which he could enjoy. But especially when you say, Oh, and then he should just bask in the glow of his everyday meaning. How long are you basking? This is one of the problems with the afterlife. Eventually, basking becomes dull and meaningless, right? So there's always a next. And so the whole project, even if somebody like Beethoven, all you have with Beethoven is somebody whose life was extraordinarily meaningful in a regular way. I could imagine myself basking for quite a long time if I composed the Ninth Symphony. I could imagine really a lot of uh, victory laps. And even if it's not, okay, eventually you'd be tired of taking the victory laps. Even if that's true, if Beethoven knew that he was going to live a thousand years, he would have just created a larger corpus to complete. But I'm not feeling the sense of why I should feel angst about that. If everyday meaning isn't mere everyday meaning, and if it can unify a whole life like this. Like I had this reaction to reading Thomas Nagel's article on absurdity, which you reference. And my, bro my younger brother took a philosophy class where he read that article and he had the same reaction I did, which is like, why should I have this kind of reaction that Nagel is having? And it, it is an interesting thing, I think, what gives different people a sense of existential or philosophical angst. Some people are really worried about free will, does it exist or not? And some people are like, who cares whether I have that or not? I feel it about whether or not there are moral facts, other people don't. And... Maybe this is another one where it's just a difference of philosophical personality. You feel angst about this thing called ultimate meaning that goes beyond everyday meaning, even everyday meaning of this tremendous sort. And it's not resonating with me at the same level. I think there's a difference. I think there can be temperamental differences or other kinds of differences between people that make this problem of ultimate meaning more or less pressing to some people rather than others. I think some, if somebody is like a happy-go-lucky person, then I remember telling this to one of my friends. She's like, yeah, my life is pointless, but it's fun. So I don't care. It's like, how much fun could it be? What are you talking about? And it's not fun. And so that's one kind of temperament. I think the more a person is a workhorse, like who loves to work and accomplish things and do things that, or thinks about meta projects or efforts or like, where's it all going? The more effort, if your life is effortful, you want that effort to go somewhere. And for some people, Life feels like less work. I'm not sure why. And some people are less work oriented. So, on the, but this is just sort of psychological speculations. And I think that in general, I would agree with you that the degrees of how pressing we find problems personally have a myriad of psychological reasons and personality reasons and all kinds of reasons that we don't know about. So, how sad you have to be, I can leave that up to you. But you should be a little sad. You're working for nothing. So I want, I want to respond to two points that you've made. 
the one, it could just be that I'm not fully understanding, but I really don't understand what you mean when you say the child that I produce is in my life. I understand that some, in some sense, the child is in my life, that my efforts towards this child are in my life, that when I speak to the child, that's a property of my life. But it seems like the child can go and do things that I'm unaware of, which are outside of my life. And I've generated that child who has that possibility of doing that. But my generation stops at the potential and then the child goes and does it. So in at least some sense, the child seems outside of my life. So that's my first question. And then my second question is, I still want to press home this idea that maybe what's going on when someone has this feeling, the phenomenology of this is not just, it might still be, I don't know what to do next. Now you say, but of course they know what to do next. They, Tolstoy has another novel in him and the great scientist has another cure in him. But here's the thing, what can they do next that trumps what they've done before? And that's much harder. The novelist that produces the great novel, much harder to then produce an even better one going forward. So what's new next? What's better next? And that's a much harder problem. And I wonder if that's not what's going on. Okay, so let's separate the questions. The first one is about your child. Of course, your child is outside of you, but let's talk about the meaning, right? If we're talking about ultimate meaning, we're looking for a point as a valued end. You value your child as a person. That value is outside of the child, outside of you, inside your life, otherwise you couldn't value it. So the fact that your child goes and do, does things, of course your child does things, your, your computer does things without you. That has nothing to do with the value that we're talking about. The value that you have in a relationship is the intimacy between you, it's outside of you, it's outside of the other person, that's why it's a valued end, that's why it can be a, there can be a point to your relationship, but of course it's in your life, where else could it be? It's in your life. That's the first question. The second question about, the, about what's the point of the rest of my life, what you've described can apply to the letdown, the climactic letdown after a great accomplishment. We don't have to even have a great accomplishment like that. Most people's lives do not include such extraordinary accomplishments and they don't have those letdowns and they could still ask this question. Tolstoy wasn't asking it after a period of great accomplishment. It was right in the middle of his life when everything was going on. So I don't think you need that to ask that question. In fact, I don't even think it's the same kind of a question. The what next is this letdown of you work too hard for something and like, okay, now I have it, right? And then it's always like, how good could it be to have it? And then, then, and then the what next? I think this, all the ultimate meaning problem is different. And I think it can, it occurs throughout your life at any time you're running it. And it can happen in the midst of everything happening, good happening to you. And in the midst of all your projects, Tolstoy was not at the end of a project when he said that he was right at the peak of his life, in the middle of his life, where he had just as much behind him as he had in front of him in terms of adult capacity. And that's what he was expressing. Now, I, like I said, he thought it was about death and everything's going to disappear in the end. I don't think that's the right diagnosis. So I, I don't think that it's, I think you can have this ultimate meaning applies to at any point in your life. It doesn't have to be after a great accomplishment. So we can definitely imagine creatures who are similar to us in some ways who don't have this kind of worry. Like certainly think of animals, think of a world of playful otters, that would be like a utilitarian paradise. How many utils would there be in a world full of playful otters? They're not worried about ultimate meaning. They're not even worried about everyday meaning, I don't think. So that makes me wonder, suppose we could genetically engineer a future version of ourselves, um, or maybe create a pill or something that would just remove the longing for ultimate meaning since we can't achieve it anyway, would there be any reason not to take the pill or genetically engineer ourselves so that we don't feel any loss when we discover there's no ultimate meaning because we don't care about it anymore? Or would that alteration somehow destroy something fundamental about our natures and that we would be somehow diminished if we didn't feel this kind of sadness? Yeah. So I think it's John Gray who wrote this book about life as a cat. I should take a look at it somewhere. I think it's right here. Some, I don't know cat philosophy, something like that, where he's like, oh, if you live like a cat, you're not going to have any of these problems. Camus says that if I was a cat among cat or a tree among trees, I wouldn't have a problem with being in the world because I would be the world. You can be a playful otter. Then, you, then of course, you lack your whole human potential. So I'm sure you're not surprised that I find utilitarianism completely stupid and unattractive. And 
beside all the points that I care about, because you could just sit around, you could take a drug and be happy. It's like the, it's the brain in the vet example, actually. That is exactly what it is. Should we just be happy? And I wouldn't be, I wouldn't want to be, because one of the things that you get by experience, I wouldn't want to, if I had a choice not to live at all, I would also take that choice to never have existed. That's a different conversation and other things I've written about. But in terms of the kind of being you're going to be, I think in order to have any meaning, you're going to have to have self-consciousness and engagement with values. And then once you do that, you also have the problem of ultimate meaning. Is it worth it? Is it worth existing at all? Probably not. But if you're going to exist, would you rather be a person or an otter? I'd much rather be a person. An otter to me is happy otter, zero appeal. I'd rather be a rock. I don't know why. This is again, maybe I just, because I think that I guess I do know why. I think some of the values of knowledge and truth and love are really great things. So I think everyday meaning is a reason. I wouldn't, I don't know that it's worth giving up on everyday meaning because then you don't have to suffer for not having ultimate meaning. Because I think, so basically, I think that's really what you're asking. Should we just give up on meaning altogether? I like meaning, even though I'm sad that I don't have a really good kind that I would love. And that would be good for me. But that's not really a, a logical or a forceful argument that tells you you must agree with me. But I think I'm describing what I think you'd be giving. Why do you think ultimate meaning is ultimate? Other than just calling it ultimate meaning? Because that's a neat trick, right? So like you can just call it ultimate meaning and then that automatically gives it top spot. Why not think that everyday meaning? Because it encompasses so much that we care about. As you said, knowledge and love. And why is that not what we should care about? I don't have a great answer for you. We should care about all of it. We should care about all meaning. Why do I call it ultimate? Because it's the meaning of your whole life. And so I do think, I don't know, when you say top spot, it's not, I do think it gets, it deserves a high billing because it's, you, you don't just do your everyday things. You also work at this other thing, which is running your whole life. This project that you do, you lead your life. And so I think it is pretty important that ultimately the leading of your whole life, pointless. But it doesn't bother me if you call it something else. You could call it whole life pointlessness or life effort, life, li life effort pointlessness. I think that devalues it a little in a way that I disagree with, but... But that's, I see room for disagreement about how important it is relative to everyday meaning. I do see room for disagreement, but I think that it is certainly very important. And the reason I call it ultimate is because it's like, ultimately, everything you do is for nothing in this kind of way. And so that's why I call it ultimate meaning. But it doesn't mean that, that there's not room to disagree about which kinds of meaning are more important and why. And that's a different conversation. And then and a worthwhile conversation, but I call it ultimate meaning because I think I'm defending that label, even though you could call it whatever you want, because you are doing this whole thing, like your whole life. Don't you want that? There's so much effort put into that. It's really disappointing that it cannot possibly have a. There is one place in your journal of controversial ideas paper, I think where you describe ultimate meaning in a slightly different way that I think opens up a different, uh, the possibility of a different kind of account of it. I think you describe it at one point as like a meta narrative. So the grand unifying narrative, I think that comes apart from this idea of a point of your life that lies outside of your life, which is what you've been hammering away at. The idea of a meta narrative, that's something that it seems like could be internal. It seems like it has to do with the structure of the life. And so there's a possibility of developing an alternative account of ultimate meaning that gets around this problem. I, I don't call, I don't talk about meta narrative. I do discuss narrative meaning, but not, I don't, I only talk about it as one example of the way we lead our lives. When I'm talking, when I think about leading a life, that's the kind of thing that needs a point and doesn't have one. And that's ultimate meaning. Narrative meaning, which is Velleman's term, is this idea that your life has this kind of meaning as a story you tell yourself. What I want to know is why are you writing a story? That's ultimate meaning. So I would not, I don't think I use the term meta narrative. 
It's our life is a meta project. But when we talk about narrative meaning, that's just one way I think of thinking about leading your life as a whole. And I will ask about that. Why are you writing a story? So I wonder if what's happening here, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but are you not presupposing that meaning is subjective? You've said a few times, what's the point in me doing this if it's not in my life? It's pointless. My life lacks ultimate meaning because the thing that it's aiming towards is not in my life. It suggests to me, maybe I'm confusing terms here, but it suggests to me that you think that meaning is subjective. It's something that the subject experiences. Why not think that meaning is objective? So my life generates certain things outside of me and my life has meaning precisely because those things are outside of me and I've generated them. So my life has objective meaning because of that. So I think it's a similar to the question you've been asking. I don't, I actually am an objectivist. So I don't think meaning is subjective because I don't think values are subjective. I'm like, I'm a moral realist. But again, you're talking about things that you are, of, it's like the same example about your child. You do these great things, you invent the vaccine, you cure cancer. That's, out, that's something that exists in the world outside of you. But the fact that you did it and the value you were aiming at is something that has a place in your life. That's why you were aiming at it. And so I am not at all a subjectivist, although I don't make the argument in the paper I wrote about ultimate meaning. I have a book project and one when I talk about everyday meaning, I do argue that everyday meaning is objective because I think value is objective. You can have subjective engagement with it, but you can still, you can have a meaningful life, meaning full of everyday meaning and not know it. And you can think your life is full of everyday meaning and be mistaken. When I say values in your life, you care about justice, you give it a place and you're right. You could be wrong. You could care about other things, but let's say you're right. You care about justice and that's why you give it a place in your, and that's why you give it a place in your life because you care about it. You're correct to do so. It's a value. The things you do toward justice exist outside of you, but the value of justice that you're aiming at is in your life. I need to press you on that. What do you mean by it's in your life? Like, I need you to define that. When you say yes. the value of it is in your life, the justice is not in your life, right? The justice is this, let's say you work on an institution and that institution has impacts on LGBTQ rights, for example. When you say the value of it is in your life, it seems like the value of it is really that it's in a whole lot of other people's lives. It's something you reach. It's outside of you because values are external to the acts but it is in your life as something that you can engage with. Let's say there was this other value that Martians had, call it schmustus. You couldn't, there's nothing, you don't know anything about it. You can't engage with it. You can't do it. You can't further it. It's a value. It's not in your life. It doesn't play a part in any of your life projects or your everyday meaning. That is the sense. Now, in contrast, justice is something you can engage with. It's one of the values available to you within your life and the life you lead to aim at. That's what I mean when I say it's in your life. Does that help? Yeah, it does help, but I'm not sold. I'm not sold. I just wonder about this distinction. I, I just, I really wonder about this and it seems to underpin the argument, right? Just for a moment, if we had to drop that distinction between the value being in your life and out of your life, then the argument doesn't go through, right? The argument for meaninglessness. So it's core, it's key. It is key and you might not be sold. I don't. It's impossible for this, for me to be wrong on this point, because that is what a value is, right? It's outside the activity and it's within your life as something that you can engage with. It's something that you choose. Let's say you decide, I don't care about justice. I will engage with another value, beauty. I will make beautiful things that increase injustice even, right? So these are all values within your life that are available to you to pursue or not pursue, to order around, they're, in, they're something that, and that's how, if you care about something, you give it a bigger place in your life. If you don't care about it, you give it a smaller place in your life. If it has, if you, that's how you engage with it. It has a place in your life and in the life project that you lead. And so I don't know what else to say to sell you on it, but you're right that it is key. And I think it is indisputable, even though you're disputing it. So I can make sense of it being fitting to be sad about something even though it's metaphysically impossible for it to be otherwise. So here's an example. It might be metaphysically impossible for 
me to be immortal or for any human to be immortal or for any kind of biological creature to be immortal. I am completely unimpressed with the kinds of consolations that philosophers have tr tried to drum up about death. Like, oh, well, you didn't exist before you were born. That didn't hurt. Like, no, this is the event of my life ending and then the state of never having any conscious experiences don't try to make me feel good about this like you're not helping with that even if it's metaphysically impossible that i live forever because of the laws of physics being metaphysically necessary whatever the story is it makes sense that it would be fitting for me to feel sad about that however there are some metaphysically impossible things where i can't make sense of even longing for that so if it's the case that like not even God could have ultimate meaning, not even God, which I think you're committed to saying that it seems really absurd to think that it is somehow fitting that, it, that I should feel sad that I don't have it. I think the first thing, you, the first part of your question contradicts with the second part of your question, right? The first part is I can agree that it's metaphysically impossible and I could be sad about it. But if even God can have ultimate meaning, why should I be sad that I don't have it? Because you should want it because you're putting forth the effort for it. So the reason for the sadness is because it's just like the other things you do in your life. You put forth effort, you think about it, you plan it, you work toward it. And then if you couldn't get it, that would be disappointing. The same thing applies to your whole life, even though death, by the way, is a beautiful release. And if you live forever, you might really come to regret that. So I do not want to live forever. I don't even want to have an afterlife. One life is bad enough. But if you're thinking about why should you be sad, the fact that it's un I mean, what you should be sad because it would be good for you. So it would be good for you if you could have it and it makes sense for you to want it. And that's why I think you should be sad that you don't have it. So if you, th and that's my answer because it would be good for you and it is the same as with your other, just like with your other efforts, it would be sad and disappointing to find out that they weren't going anywhere. So too with this overall effort of leaving your whole life. And the fact that even God couldn't have it is just another reason to be not so impressed with God. But it doesn't mean you shouldn't be sad about it. Well, I want to push back because with the case of immortality, even though these two things are metaphysically impossible, I know what it is to be alive and the goods of being alive, and I have some appreciation of what I'm losing. But if it turns out that ultimate meeting is something that God can't even have, then I'm questioning the even the coherence of the concept, because it seems like God has all of the goods that it, it's like conceptually consistent for him to have. I'm just losing, if it's something that God couldn't even have, then the bar is so, so high that I, I have trouble even seeing it as desirable, as you insist it is. What does God have to do with anything? I don't understand why this is coming into play. It would be good for you, God or no God. It would be good for you if the work you're putting in wasn't going absolutely nowhere. If the effort and the heartache and the angst and everything else you put into running your life, which is difficult and sometimes miserable, even though you want to keep that misery forever, I'm not sure why. It would be good for you because it is always good for efforts to, have a, to be able to come to fruition. And the fact that it can't is bad for you. And the fact that nobody could have it is just bad for anybody who puts forth efforts, which is why maybe you'd rather be a happy otter and not God, because God couldn't have this either. But anyone who puts forth an effort to running their life, which if you're an agent, it's what you do, will have this disappointment. So I love eating chocolate. Love it. It's a, it's a deep-seated desire. I love it, but I hate the effects. I get fat and I'm lactose intolerant. So the effects are awful. So I have this, it would definitely be good for me to be able to eat infinite chocolate with no negative effects, right? It would be good for me. And I can imagine that. I think you'd agree with that. I certainly feel it. But should I lament the fact that I can't eat infinite chocolate with no negative consequences? Should I feel disappointed about it? Should it become a part of my life. It doesn't seem so. So it doesn't seem like just because something would be good for you, that the absence of it is something that you should be disappointed about. I think you should be disappointed, maybe not so disappointed because it's not so important and you should eat dark chocolate anyway, because milk chocolate is fake. To your point, how disappointed you be, you should be. So if something would be good for you and you can't have it, but it's trivial, so you don't have to be that disappointed because you don't have to eat. First of all, 
infinite chocolate, you get tired of it, but whatever. Let's say you're just, let's take something simpler. You like, you enjoy chocolate and you're allergic to it. That's disappointing. It would be good for you if you weren't. You could be sad about it. You're not going to sob your whole life over it. There's lots of other things to do. So how sad should you be is a legitimate question. How sad should you be that you don't have ultimate value? The reason I think you should be very sad is because of how much effort you put into running your life and how hard it is. That's the reason. But exactly how sad, I think there's room to disagree. But the reason, so again, to your point, should you be sad for anything that you, that's good for you that you don't have? Yes, but only a little sad for some things that are not so important. But to me, this is pretty important because of how hard it is and because of how much work you put in, because you do it your whole life. You're like always running on this treadmill to nowhere, to nowhere. and it's exhausting and it in includes suffering. And so you're sadder than, let's say, the chocolate that you're allergic to that you can't have. Okay, so I think this is a really important point that you're making now, and I think this is where we'd have to fight. So one way of fighting back is to say, maybe my daily efforts are not about trying to find ultimate meaning, but just about trying to find everyday meaning. And I know we've relegated it with this term everyday meaning, but it's really important. There's lots of sub values there that are really important. And so it seems like, yes, day in and day out, despite suffering, I carry on and I work hard on my life and I improve the relationships in my life and the knowledge in my life and the love in my life. So all those everyday values get bumped up and my everyday meaning gets bumped up. But then it seems like my life, even if you want to say as a whole, in terms of your definition of ultimate meaning is lacking that ultimate meaning, it still possesses everyday meaning. And so it's not like I've been working at this with no, no impact on the world, or it's not that, that I've been working on this with no side effects. There, there are, and maybe that's good enough. And so I shouldn't be that disappointed. I don't think we disagree so much. Our disagreement is maybe in proportion because sure, you should do your best to have a everyday meaning, to have a life that's more meaningful than a life that's less meaningful. And there's a lot you can do in that. So this is not just complete denial, it's certainly not nihilism or life is meaningless, but I do think that this is just a sad aspect of your life. And it can really come sometimes overshadow all, this, all the things in it that are meaningful because of how hard it is. But I think that the two feelings or the two responses don't contradict and can coexist and frequently do coexist within the person. So suppose somehow, conceivably, to, you're actually wrong about this. Suppose it was the case that you were actually wrong about this, but don't know how. You don't know what at which step in your argument the logic fails or something. But you were given the opportunity to, to trade some everyday meaning for some ultimate meaning. How much would you be willing to what would you be willing to give up for ultimate meaning? Suppose it were a conceivable trade-off you could make. I would trade a lot, even though I think it's metaphysically impossible and it's really hard for me to engage the question because everyday part of the, the way I think about everyday meaning is consistent with the way I think about ultimate meaning in terms of points being valued ends and value. So it is hard for me to engage the question, but I'm going to do it anyway and say, I would trade a lot of it because I think that running a life is really hard and involves so much sadness and loss. And even though I don't, and everybody dies and that's sad, even though life is horrible, which is also sad. And so I would, I think this is really what you're asking me is similar to what we were talking about before in terms of the proportion of which is more important. And I actually don't make arguments about that to say, Ultimate meaning is more important. Everyday meaning is more important. I think we should want both. I think they're both important. One we can have, so I'm not bothered to being sad about that one. And the other one we can't have, which is very sad. And so I don't have necessarily, I think I would trade a lot, but I don't, that's really not, it doesn't really matter to the kind of points I'm making, how much I would trade between everyday meaning and ultimate meaning. I'm just saying these are two separate kinds. One kind we have, great. The other kind we don't have. So one of our previous guests on the show, David Benatar, he presents not the same argument as yours, obviously, but he also thinks that there's at least two types of meaning and he places priority on one of them. So he thinks that cosmic meaning is the kind of meaning that we lack because we can't impact the cosmos. We can't make an impact at the cosmic level. Although we can make an impact on an individual to individual level, 
we shouldn't care about that as much. We should really care about the cosmic level. So I have two questions for you. The one is, how does that compare with your views? So where would you place cosmic meaning? And then secondly, I'm curious because we put this question to David and I'm dissatisfied with his response. And I wonder if you have a similar problem is we asked David, but then why not commit suicide? So he also has the line, it would be better if I wasn't born. But the harder question is, why not end it right now? And he says, well, I could be wrong about these things. Or he says that the death would involve a lot of pain and suffering, but that doesn't convince me because we could do it in a very painless way. So then the question becomes, in your case, if your life lacks ultimate meaning, why don't we ultimately end it? So you asked two questions. So let me start with the first one. I don't agree with David about David Ventar about cosmic meaning at all. So when we think about cosmic meaning, cosmic meaning is the meaning that we have based on our role in the cosmos. I don't think that's so important either way. Let's say we have this cosmic role. We're uniquely intelligent. We're food for the gods. What does that do for our lives? If we don't have ultimate meaning, who cares if we have cosmic meaning? And if we do have ultimate meaning, also who cares if we have cosmic meaning? So I find cosmic meaning mostly unimportant. It adds very little value to my life either way. What I care about is whether I have human meaning, everyday meaning, ultimate meaning. Cosmic meaning is like, all right, if you have it, it's fine. If you don't have it, it seems also fine. So I completely disagree with Benatar on this point. And why he gives it such a large role, I don't really understand. Now to the question of suicide. If your life is ultimate, ultimately meaningless, which it is, killing yourself earlier rather than later is not going to have an impact on that problem. There is nothing you can do with that problem, and killing yourself does not solve it. On the other hand, your life has everyday meaning, and while you're here, you might as well engage with that and have an everyday meaningful life. And so there's no reason. It's just because you're sad about it. It would be the same thing like, well, I don't have the chocolate, so I should kill myself. You have other things. So it's not a reason, even though I think we should lament it and recognize it. And I also think it's helpful because it can be helpful, at least for me, to understand this is where this dissatisfaction is coming from. This is the sad part. This is the meaningless part, even though I have these other kinds of meaning. But it's no, no particular reason to kill yourself. It doesn't solve the problem, and it's not your whole life. It's just this important thing that is missing from your life and is sad. But you have other things, and you have other meaning. You have everyday meaning. Now, wait, you said the reason to be sad, the reason to be sad, or even very sad, is that it's fitting, not that it's going to solve the problem. Your being sad isn't going to solve the problem of the lack of ultimate meaning. So maybe you could say killing yourself isn't going to solve the problem, but it's a fitting response. If a project is purposeless, you stop the project. That's a fitting thing to do. Why not say that? I think that's a really fair question, actually. And I don't think that, I think that it is a fitting response to this problem. But it also puts a stop to everything else you're engaging with, to all the people that might be relying on you. So one of the reasons I think not to commit suicide is the sadness and the anguish you'll cause to other people. And if you would cause no anguish to other people, I think your reason is much reduced, quite possibly to almost nothing, unless you would cause anguish to yourself. Because you have this, yeah, you're, so you could stop the project. It would be a fit, fitting response to say this project is pointless i should stop doing it the only thing is in order to stop doing this project you have to stop doing all the other projects and those other projects are not meaningless and that could give you a reason to persist and not to kill yourself yeah so i was thinking if you're going to say killing yourself might be fitting but you shouldn't do it anyway because of all of these other goods you can say the same thing about the sadness right like okay sadness would be fitting but you should all things considered you shouldn't feel sad because the sadness is going to get in the way with all of your other projects. So that cuts the other way. So the difference is that you can be sad and happy at the same time. You can be sad about your ultimate, no ultimate meaning, even very sad about it, while at the same time being enjoying or appreciating the things that you do have. But if you kill yourself, you cannot also pursue your other projects. I'm not saying you should kill yourself or not kill yourself. 
I'm saying that rising and being sad about not having ultimate meaning doesn't compel you to kill yourself. And it doesn't mean that's the only fitting response because you have these other things. Whereas when you're saying, well, I can be happy. Yes, you can be happy about one thing and sad about something else simultaneously, which is what I think you should be. I think life appropriately elicits a mixed re So I think that's a good answer and that convinces me, but it opens up another problem for you. So. Earlier, you said that you would prefer not to have been born. Couldn't we use exactly the same reasoning to show why it would be better for you to have been born, even if your life ultimately lacks ultimate meaning, but still has everyday meaning, which is enough of a, an offset to bring you into existence as a good thing? Because that's not the reason I, I would prefer not to exist. I am, I'm risk averse, and I think life is full of risk. So I don't, don't argue that we should not exist. I think it's, a, and I raise this question, even in procreative ethics, should we create people knowing that they cannot have ultimate meaning, which is so disappointing, but it is not, I think there's room for reasonable disagreement on that question and places you can fall along the spectrum. But my personal reason for wishing I had never existed or for worrying about imposing existence on future people is, is because of the risks of suffering and sadness. And we know for sure you're not going to have ultimate meaning. So that's already one bad thing that you can just write down as on the negative side. But it's more my worry about existence for myself and for future people is a, based on the risk assessment. So it's not just based on meaning.